Welcome to Lecture 20 of Biology 115 entitled Microevolution. As we continue our journey at looking at evolution and how it works as a process um, in the realm of biology, we've already established the first ideas behind evolution, specifically those tied with Darwin and even those ideas pre-Darwin. We're going to be continuing this discussion on evolution by now discussing something known as microevolution. And before we get into that, we're going to start off with an introductory flowchart, just like always, just to give us a good framework for what this lecture is all about. So we'll entitle this first flowchart on microevolution simply Introduction. So this is our introduction flowchart. And of course, with any introduction, we need to get a strong basis on a couple of different terms. First and foremost, we have to understand the term evolution and what it means. Hopefully from our previous lecture you have a strong understanding of it, but nonetheless we can define evolution as simply changes in a population over time. Okay, Changes in a population, so pop will stand for population, that's the key here, over time. Now, why do I mention population as being the key here? Because evolution is certainly absolutely not, it is absolutely not the changes seen in an individual. Okay, not changes in individual, which will just be IND, over their lifetime. So what we're talking about right now is not the individual evolving. An individual, a specific person, a specific thing does not evolve. This does not happen. What happened and what happens is populations over time, over a long period of time usually, um, evolve. That's what we consider evolution. We're going to actually show uh, a bit more of this definition as we continue our discussion on evolution as a whole um, for the next couple of lectures. The next term we need to understand is that evolution, though it happens in populations and not in individuals, can actually be seen on what we call a micro scale, and we will refer to this as microevolution. Now, we're not talking about microbiology, we're just talking about, let's say, a smaller version of evolution, simply defined as the following. Microevolution will include minor, there's the micro part of the word, minor evolutionary changes. So we'll say minor evolutionary changes. And now these changes are going to occur in the individual or the population. Of course, these minor evolutionary changes um, are of the population. Okay, so minor evolutionary changes of populations, and now we'll actually say over few generations. So from generation to generation, we'll see some minor changes. And this is what microevolution really entails. But more specifically, what we're going to start being uh, start referring to now in this microevolution uh, lecture is the topic and idea of allele frequencies. Specifically, whenever you have evolution, even in the microevolution definition of the word, evolution is ideally going to be this sense of change in respect to what we call allele frequencies. So we're going to say that microevolution it's included in this definition, but there's also a second part, that it is the change in what we call allele frequencies, which I'll just be referring to as AF from this point forward, as we're going to be talking about them a lot. A change in allele frequencies, and of course this is going to be in populations, not in the individual, in populations over generations. So again, this does not happen within one generation, it does not happen within one individual. Evolution is a process, okay, that means it takes time, and if we want to see minor evolutionary changes, minor changes in allele frequencies, we have to observe those within populations over several generations, okay? So this is a key idea behind evolution and microevolution, which is a realm of evolution in and of itself. Now, the next topic we have to understand in this introduction is the term variation. Now, we've heard of this term many times before, all the way when we talked about DNA and DNA turning into protein and all the variation associated with that. Right now, we're going to really just look at a bare-bones version of variation by splitting it into two basic ideas. And these two basic ideas are things we've already established, but we're going to relook at them from an evolutionary perspective. First and foremost, variation can be found phenotypically. So we're going to call the first topic of variation as phenotypic variation. 
So you should already be thinking what type of variation this is if we're referring to phenotypic. And this is simply variation that is seen because it is. Um, these are visible observations that you can make. Okay, These are visible observations, visual, physical variations that we see in our environment and in the organisms that surround us. A good way to think about phenotypic variation, just to make sure that you understand it, is that phenotypic variation is often considered um, in, of this mentality of either or. It's this either or mentality, meaning that there are either or differences that are seen phenotypically. Simply speaking, you either, you know, have the trait, so that's the either or either, um, have the trait, so we'll say have trait, or what's the other option? If you have the trait, what's the other option? Or you don't have the trait. So that's very clear to see. That's very clear to observe. And thus, we can see if somebody has blonde hair or we can see if they don't have blonde hair. That is phenotypic variation in a nutshell. And most of the time, when we see something in this simplistic either-or difference mentality, we're oftentimes referring to the variation, the phenotypic variation seen at single genes. Okay, So the gene for hair color. Um, this is all just made up examples. The gene for hair color, the gene for eye color, all of these things that we imagine are single genes or have been saying are single genes are either or differences in our phenotypic variation that cause visible, obs observable differences um, that we see all around us. In addition, you could have this either or mentality in phenotypic variation or what is more often seen actually, and we're going to see this as we move forward through this lecture, are what we call graduations, okay? Um, actually not graduations, gradations, wrong word, gradations. So there's a grade of uh, phenotypic variation, meaning that this gradation is going to be going along what we can consider a continuum a continuum. So what are gradations along a continuum? What does that mean? Well, simply speaking, when we see more than just an either-or mentality, when we think of something like height, right, that's a very, very variable um, trait that we see in populations, and it's, a, a, it's on a continuum. There's a grade uh, level in terms of height. Basically, what we can state is if you see something that has a gradation along the continuum, you know, we don't just see short and tall people. There are middle uh, people that are not, you know, particularly tall or particularly short. And then there are a bunch of people throughout that spectrum, throughout that continuum of height. That usually means that we're actually looking at more than one gene because we see a lot more than just this either-or mentality. We see a gradation, we see a continuum, we see a spectrum. So this is what we mean by phenotypic variation. Notice what I've been using in my language. See, observe, view, things that we can definitely see 100% within the population. There are two ways to define them in these either-or differences or these gradations along a continuum. So that's just one type of variation, and variation is absolutely necessary for evolution to happen and microevolution to happen. Variation is a prerequisite of those things. We're going to see why as we move forward.